Good evening. Good to see each and every one of you out this evening. It's an encouragement to me, that's for sure. Um, I am amazingly going to try some PowerPoint. I, again, we need to try and get out of our comfort zone, so I say, you know what? Okay, I'm going to do this, and it's going to be basic. So I'm gonna, and it's funny, sister came to me after this morning service and says, so oh, are you going to be down moving around? I says, uh-uh, I'm still behind the pulpit. I will use some power, a little bit of PowerPoint. But, um, and that was encouraging, Zach. And he mentioned the leadership class. Uh, it has been a good thing. Some young fellows in that class, it's just a good good study to have. Um, and I appreciate him and his desire to, to speak God's word and just be a part of that. So, um, would you consider yourself to be a re renaissance man? You, have you ever heard of what a renaissance man is? Kind of, a, and you, I see that commercial, and I don't want, it's, it's actually a beer commercial about this fella that's, you know, he's social, he's physical, he's, he's got everything. He, he, he listens to classical music and all the classics and all that stuff. So he's kind of a balanced man, and that's kind of my lesson this, this evening is being a well-balanced Christian. Um, but this Renaissance man, it, it came to, to be in the Renaissance period of history in the 16th, 17th century, and it's probably best described of, of two individuals, Michelangelo, who was a sculptor, a painter, architect, and a poet. So it's kind of well, uh, you know, it's somewhat rounded, but it mentioned also Leonardo da Vinci, who was a painter, a scientist, philosopher, engineer, and a mathematician. Talk about having, you know, all these kind of things. And so I'd like to consider how well-rounded we are as, as Christians. Um, I got this idea from reading the book, I Dare You, from William Danforth. The book was written in 1920. <clears throat> it's now, I think, um, what's it say? It's uh, one of the top 10 self-help books of all time. It's an older book, and I'm sure, I don't think anybody probably has read it. I, I actually got it on, uh, I listened to it. Aaron got me to where I listen to book now, listen to a book now. Actually, I couldn't find, the library didn't have it in, you know. <clears throat> but, so I listened to that. And you might think, you might recognize, though, that uh, the emblem that this William Danforth started this company, a pet food product company. Um, and that was uh, Perina Pet Food. And if you remember the emblem, the four squares outside, and he actually had, he, I think he started this dog or pet food company back in 1904. And he had this, this emblem was even before then. The four squares on the outside into the, it was described the lifestyle of a well-balanced person and these four different outer squares were individual principle. And we will look at each one of those principles. And the center square is being that well-balanced, he had it considered as a person. But I would like to look at it as being a well-balanced Christian. We're gonna use scripture. And I think he basically, he got his idea, mentions in the book, from Luke chapter two, verse 52, which states, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom, in stature, favor with God, and favor with man. You might see those four points in there. <clears throat> and, but the, the one thing that William Danforth said that each one of these square, all each one of these squares were equal and of value for each. And of course, we would think, hold on, the religious square should probably be more like 100%. And I think we cannot, it cannot be 100% working on our faith or religious section of, and you'll see that all four, all three of these are, are gonna work together with that portion. Um, but again, the, the four principles that William Danforth wanted his readers to, to balance was physical, mental, 
social, and religious parts of their life. And I know that, most, again, we may not agree with that, but we also need to see that these three portions, the body, the mind, and the heart, also belong to the Lord. <clears throat> and we need those three to support our faith or religion. And that's why I said, had uh, Brace read James chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27, if anyone thinks his religious himself to be religious. So if you consider yourself to be religious, yet you bridle not your tongue. The tongue is a physical portion of your body. You need to learn to control that. Do not deceive your heart. Feelings are your mind. Um, this man's religion is worthless. This is, pure, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of, our, uh, sight of our God and Father to visit the orphans, the widows in distress, and keep oneself unstained from the world. We, you need to use that physical body. And that's where going to be my first point. And some of us will say, oh, yuck. how about 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8? It tells us that for bodily discipline is of only a little profit, but godliness is profitable to all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. I'd like for you to look at this passage. It doesn't say that bodily discipline is of no profit. It says it's a little, little profit, and you would compare that to what is profitable for the present life, and also the life to come, the spiritual. So look at that as being um, the bodily discipline is, is good for this time period. We're, our, of course, we know our bodies are just temporary. We're going to run away with. So bodily discipline is good for this time period when, of course, godliness is profitable for eternity. So bodily discipline is good. Um, bodily discipline is described as bodily discipline is only good um, we're also we need to understand that God is going to judge us for what we do in this tent in our body you will be judged by the deeds you perform in the body Romans chapter 2 and verse 6 God will render to every man according to his deeds 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be, rec may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. So yeah, this, what we do and how we discipline this body, we will be judged upon what we do with it. We realize, again, I think William Danforth, that Luke chapter two, or two, verse 52, Jesus came in the flesh. He was tempted. He disciplined his body. He disciplined the flesh. Um, he also was, and I know he disciplined his physical body to the point where he was able to walk distant, very long distances. Um, what is it? The distance from Sea of Galilee to Caesarea Philippi is 25 miles. The distance from Capernaum to Jerusalem is 100 miles. That's a lot of walk. I mean, and I'm not saying that Jesus worked out or anything, but he controlled himself to where he was fit enough to do the work that God required him to do. Of course, we know that he disciplined his body in the way that he controlled his temper and how he dealt with other individuals. Um, of course, he endured the physical beating um, without lashing out. Um, but he used his body, his physical body, to carry out God's will. Um, and he had the energy to do that. Well, you, he took time to take, you know, take rest and s remove himself from, from the crowd. Um, but he, he needed that energy. And is it... Is that not a worthwhile goal for us to be able to have the energy so we're able to perform the required things that God asks of us as children of God? Again, we go back to the James chapter 2. Are we able to visit, are we willing to get up out of our chair 
and take the energy and go visit somebody or go help somebody you know who's in need whether it be helping them put a por- you know a deck on the back of their house or lady you know cooking for them whatever it is but we need to have the our physical bodies we need to take care of them energy is described as a physical and mental vitality the ability to perform physical tasks and the feeling of being alert and active to accomplish physical and cognitive tasks. And I'm sure we all want to have more energy. And some of us, but you have to desire to discipline yourself. And I know it comes a little bit easier to some of us. You know, you know me, I've been called a gym rat. I, I'm more physical about, I, I like to do, tell me what to do, I'll do it. You know, when it comes to studying, you know, sitting down and reading a book and trying to comprehend that, I'm challenged with that. But that's something I need to work on and other things. We need to make sure that we improve to be that well-balanced Christian. Um, but you, again, you need, to make, you need to be able to discipline yourself. Um, take that walk. Um, I know... And I've had discussions with people who says, well, I'm too tired to walk. Well, get, you know what? How about if you get up and start walking, you, you will get the energy. And people say, well, I'm just too tired to walk. Well, get up and walk, and you will get some energy. I know it sounds defeated but, or opposite of that, but trust me, that will happen, and you discipline yourself in that way. And again, you can find... Sources of energy through food. There are foods that will make you tired, <laughs> will drag you down. And so you might want to think about doing that, um, checking your diet out. I have, um, you have to decide what's good for you. I mean, again, I have found willpower to say no to a lot of things. Now. I like a lot of good food, and, but I've found out, you know what, I feel kind of cruddy when I eat this kind or that kind. So, um, and again, we've got our strong suits, and so we need to work on those that we, we struggle with. And we need to remember, though, that this body we have is the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own? We are vessels of God, and he, we need to allow him to use our bodies for what he desires, us to, desires him to use us for. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. This is service to God. So, as William Danforth in his book, he always, he, I dare, you hear this repeated in his book, I dare you to commit yourself to improve the things that will increase your energy and give you the ability to be about doing God's work. And it sometimes take a mental thing, and that gets to the second point, mental or wisdom. In his book, he's, he called it creativity. Um, But he said, don't think of it as being craftsy or artsy. Think more of an ability to create, generate new and valuable valuable ideas, concepts or solutions, imagination or expressions, going about things in a novel idea, just willing to think, you know, learn some things and change some things. A person who's creative, has a creative mind, tends to be a little more more open-minded. You think that would help being a Christian, being a little more open-minded and curious, willing to take some some risks? Um, this is someone. This is someone's attitude that I need to learn more, not just scan through some information. You know, and he in his book challenged uh, find a subject or some a hobby or something and actually delve into it, read it, deep research it, and and kind of stimulate your mind um so and i know in the days day and age we sit here on our phones and we just scroll through these qu- and get you know little topic you know i know about this and i do you really know about this or you just you know this little paragraph you read 
How about you dig, dig into something a little bit deeper and stimulate that mind? And of course, certainly we need to dig deeper into God's word. If there's anything we need to dig deeper in, and that's where we need, some of us, we need humility because we've been Christians for a while. You know, we think, oh, we, I got this. We're never going to get all of it that he's got. Uh, so dig into that deeper and make sure that you are diligent to present yourself approved of God, a workman who does not to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are many Bible examples of those that have come to the point where they humbled themselves and found out that they needed help. They needed to learn more. We see that in Acts chapter 8 and verse 34, the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember that? He was reading Isaiah. He didn't understand it. He was willing to ask, um, please tell me, who does this prophet say, that, say this of himself or someone else? He didn't understand. He was, again, he humbled himself and was willing to ask. Peter, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, where he said, most certainly understand now that God is not the one to show partiality by every nation, the man who fears he does, not what, he does what is right and welcome to him. When, he, when Peter saw that vision, finally understanding that it was, the, it was to go into all the world, all of mankind. And Apollos in Acts chapter 18 and verse 26, when he was taught and told of the baptism of Jesus, came to a better understanding. He was willing to change and move on from that. And Paul was uninformed, but was willing to learn to change in his need in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Not that I speak for, from want, for I have learned to be content whatever circumstances I am. I know, how, I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity. And in all the circumstances, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry both in having abundance and suffering need. So he was willing, again, willing to learn, and we need to continue to do that, stimulate our mind. And it's easy, you know, again, some of us more mature or even the younger folks, it's like, you know what? This is the way I was brought up as a child, but we need to not stand on our parents, grandparents' faith. We need to own our own faith. We need to delve into it and make sure that we know and are confident in, um, in our salvation. Need to better understand to the point where we, will, where we will be able to face the storms and be able, to be able to tell people about our faith. And that leads us to the next point, the social aspect or finding favor with man as, as it speaks of in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52 or our personality. Personality is defined as a uni unique, consistent pattern of thought and behavior. In simple terms, it's who I am, your personality is who you are, the characteristics that distinguish you from different individuals. Your personality affects how other people perceive you and interact with you. Um, you think it'd be important in fulfilling God's responsibilities, being social with people? Aren't we supposed to be the salt, the influencer of people's lives, the light that it speaks of in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 through 16? So we can't use the excuse, well, that's just the way I am. I'm not very social. I can't talk to people. I, my wife is great about that. I'm not so much so, and, as, you know, I'm... <laughs> I don't speak very well, and I shy away from being social, but, but that is, God, God requires me to do that, to reach out to people. And so I need, so I need to be better about doing that. Um, Jesus found favor with men. Do you think that Jesus had to change his approach to the various different people that he was trying to teach? Jesus conversed with the rich Young ruler, if you remember that, the poor, 
He reached out to those who were looked down upon, the Samaritan woman and the tax gatherers. So reaching out to them. And even those who were so-called religious, the Pharisees, the scribes, and then those 12 individuals that he had as his apostles, various different, you know, individuals. And so we need to find out how to be better about socializing and about, again, preach, you know, <laughs> I say preaching, being that example to people, finding out where they're at. And I know some people, <laughs> again, they may say, well, that's just, I'm, I'm just not social. Well, learn how to be. We need to love people. We need to love people to the point where they see <laughs> that we love them and what we're trying to do for them. So um, let's not think that, you know, that's just the way, I, let's work on that. We can read that Paul adapted his personality to win souls for Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 19 through 22. For though I am free of all men, I've made myself a slave to all, that I might win more, win the more. And to the Jews I became a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, and those not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And isn't that what we're supposed to do? We are supposed to be that instrument that God uses. So let us strive to win all. And what's that second greatest commandment? Matthew chapter 22 and verse 39. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. How can you love your neighbor and you don't even talk to him? I know we had this discussion before about, I know society now, it's like nobody knows their neighbor. You know, and it is, sometimes it is difficult when they don't want you to talk to them and they're not around or whatever. We don't have that. I mean, our neighbors, we know each other and we, take, we pick up packages or whatever and we talk about, we, they invite us to their, their kids' birthdays and things like that. So, but that's, you know, a way, again, a way of loving your next door neighbor or Again, your, co your fellow worker, co-worker, you need to show them. Um, show them Jesus. Um, so our personality or our um, personality does affect our relationship with God and being religious. So we do need that in our life. You also have a natural tendency when it comes to social and other relationships with each other, as Aaron knows, the high, you know, we got all these different, <laughs> which I'm like, yeah, I know, I'm just a doer. I like to do things, and I'm not a social. But, again, we need to work on those things. Second Timothy 2 and verse 24, 25, the Lord's bondservant must, be not, must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, be able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, and per if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Again, being kind and patient, that's being, you got to know people. And we can't just have that attitude of, well, I'm just quick-tempered, or I'm, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a people person. Which leads to, again, our religious responsibility. Again, Jesus found favor with God. Or we call it spirituality or our faith. We can also use the term real, um, righteousness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 through 16 tells us that if we allow the fleshly desires to rule our decisions, 
it's going to make, us, make it more difficult to understand the inspired word of God. But the natural man, it speaks of in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For those, for the, uh, let me start over again there. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit, spiritual, of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know because they are spiritually discerned or opposed. And I knew I'd forget it one time, but we'll get that other word up there. So um, we need to guard against being influenced by this word, by this world. Um, these things are temporary. Again, this body is only a temporary. James chapter 4 and verse 4 uses some pretty strong language. You, you adulteresses. Do you not know the friendship with this world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 through 8, um, we're not to live for the flesh. For those who, are, those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. Of course, that's spiritual death, but the mind said on the spirit is life and peace and we know the peace that we can enjoy because the mind is set on the flesh is hostile toward God for it does not subject itself to the law of God for it's not able to do so because it's striving after the, this world and those who are of the flesh cannot please God Genesis or Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24 through 26 says now that those who belong to Christ have been crucified the flesh, not living for the flesh. Again, you're going to discipline your, your body with its passions and desires. If we live for the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit, follow the Spirit, which means we need to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gladness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and we see, I think we can see some of these these three three blocks: the physical, mental, and social. In that list, again, love. We need to love being social with other people. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Those are again; those are ways of showing our faithfulness, our our self-control, gentleness, and self-control, controlling this body. And if, we are, if we're able to do that and we thirst after righteousness, as it says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, we will be blessed and we'll be satisfied. Again, we go back to this James chapter 1 and verse 26. What was true religion? Did you visit the orphans and the widows in distress? That means you want to visit them. You need to have the love for them. Be social with them. You need to go, you need to, um, and you need to know who to go to, when to go to, and why you're going, the mental part of it. If you do these things, God will bless you. Psalm chapter 41 and verse 1, how blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in the day of troubles. Can you see how all four of these kind of work together for each other? and make us a more well-balanced Christian. And it makes us, gives us the ability to fulfill that great command that God's given us, to speak to others, to preach the word, in season and out of season, wherever we go. So I hope this has benefit, benefited you in your walk with Christ. And if you have not yet rendered obedience to Christ, you have, the, you have that opportunity now. If you understand that Jesus came to this earth, died, lived in a way that showed us the example to live and put himself upon the cross so that he would shed his blood, that we could be forgiven of our sins by being baptized for the remission of our sins and live for him, be confident that you can have the peace and live forever with him. Or if there's anyone here that is, uh, who has fallen short of and needs the prayers 
the congregation would encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing.